I mean, it's been a, as, as you can imagine, like for everyone, it's been a bit of an odd year. Uh, last March, I was supposed to be exhibiting in the Coningsby Gallery, and of course, we all know that that's exactly when the pandemic hit. Um, and as a result, that exhibition was closed. And at the time, I didn't realise that that actually would be the first, uh, the last exhibition that I had in a public space until December. And even then, when I managed to get a squeeze in a quick show in Fitzrovia in London, um, that ended up closing because once again, London went into lockdown. So I'm quite excited to be back at the Cronsby Gallery again on the 19th of April, um, only for a week. Um, hopefully I will get the whole week. And <laughs> um, because it will be, you know, it will be wonderful to have pictures in a public space again. One of the things that actually the pandemic has thrown up is people have been spending a lot of time at home. There has been a knock-on effect, I think, where people are looking at their walls and thinking, do you know what, now's the time where I'm going to invest some money into a picture. I mean, one of the finds that I, uh, of the last year which I was most excited about was this painting um, by Peter de Francia. It's this sort of wonderful depiction of men lunching in a quarry in Lacoste in uh, Provence. Um, in 90, although the painting is 1958, in 1957 Peter de Francia had bought a house in Lacoste in the south of France um, and he used to go every summer and he would paint there. Um, but it's this sort of wonderful post-impressionist depiction of labourers taking a break from the blistering sun um, under the trees in the quarry. And um, de Francia himself, uh, he was a professor at the Royal College for many years. But um, in the way that in the 50s, in I suppose it's most, it, it's more known about in terms of um, the theatre, um, there was a more of a focus on uh, working people and celebrating them. Um, so I've sold a painting, uh, a, a drawing before of, of one which was entitled Dockers from the, from the 50s. Um, in the, the Tate in 2012 bought a number of his drawings. So this is a classic example of me buying something where I was just driven by the desire to want to own the image. I love it. I mean, it's from the 30s. It's a, a cubist portrait, which in itself is quite unusual, by a Swiss artist who I'd never heard of, who actually um, is mainly known for still lives and landscapes. Um, but having said all that, I just think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, so this is another of my finds in the last year. Uh, it's a self-portrait of the artist. The artist is called Van Boyden, who was Belgian. It's from about 1905. What's so wonderful about it is, is like with a lot of self-portraits, is there is that added intensity between the portrait and the sitter because obviously they are looking at themselves in a mirror and painting themselves. Sometimes when people paint portraits of sitters, there is that lo lack of connection. Um, it, if you look closely, you'll see in the background of the painting that there is the swirls from the wall fabric, which it's very much in the Art Nouveau style, and that style is carried into the frame, which is, um, was clearly chosen by the artist to reflect what's on the canvas. I mean, the most wonderful thing about this image in particular is not only is it Tony Sansone, who was a, a student of the original Charles Atlas, but also, um, if you look at it, it's so wonderfully posed in this sort of, um, it looks like a sort of, 1930s mantelpiece, you know, these wonderful deco straight lines. Um, and it is so much more than just an image of a male nude. I mean, this work by Francis Plummer is, uh, is another artist who I've come across uh, in the last year. I've got a number of works by Plummer and a number of will be on show at the, in, in April um, at the Coningsby Gallery. He was a British artist um, who he didn't really, although he was a graduate of the Royal Academy in the 1950s, uh, he was quite reclusive and he didn't really show a lot of his work. He had the occasional exhibition, but um, 
As a result, when he died um, in 2019, um, he, he had a complete mass of pictures which, uh, which remained unsold. And, and it's not often you get to say this about an artist, but uh, whether you love them or hate them, they're unbelievably well executed and he is truly original in, in his style and outlook. So one of the joys about uh, representing Michael Leonard is that he gave me access to uh, a number of works which uh, are really early for, for him. So I have two portraits um, which he painted in 1959 and I mean he was born in 1933 so he was 26 at the time. He was working as a commercial illustrator. So these are really personal portraits of friends of his that he would never ever have thought that one day might be exhibited. Uh, I have two paintings and a very large uh, pastel drawing by Patrick Hennessy, who is uh, he's an artist that I've known about for a number of years, who was a, um, he's just a complete favourite of mine. Um, the two paintings that I have in the collection, in, in particular this one, um, were both featured in a retrospective at the Irish Museum of Modern Art in Dublin in 2015, and this one was used in the publicity. Someone told me once that one of the best ways of understanding some of Hennessy's work is to look at what's going on in, in the back of the picture. And in the back of this picture is someone climbing down to the rocks, obviously uh, about to be joined by the main figure in the painting. Um, this adds a whole other sort of sexual frisson to the painting that would, wouldn't be there were it not for the other figure. I mean here, uh, the majority of the pictures on this wall uh, could broadly be described as academic studies. I mean they're called academic studies really because um, from the um, Renaissance right through to the sort of mid-50s in Western art schools, um, it, it was very much in the academic tradition that people would learn to draw, but really they are called, they're, they're life studies. The range here sort of stems from uh, probably the mid-19th century right through to as a Russian drawing from the 50s and 60s. Um, but I think the reason why, you know, there are a lot of academic studies about, um, a lot of them are not very good, um, but I think if you pick the right ones, um, they can be extraordinary. I mean, this one, for example, um, I have no idea, despite the fact it's, it's signed, who the artist is. I've spent many an hour trying to work that out. Um, but it is of such high quality, you know, it, I was immediately drawn to it. Um, this one here by William Mulready. Mulready was a, an artist in the 19th century who um, really became very well known for uh, the style of his, his life drawing, which again is, is particularly exquisite. This is actually uh, quite late in his career, but I think what shows that despite the fact that you know, he was coming to the end of a, a very well-established career, he still thought it was incredibly important to continue drawing from life, to, to learn and understand how to draw the human body. One of the most extraordinary things about doing this job is obviously I've looked at a lot of academic studies um, out from all different countries, but um, the way to spot a Russian one is they've always got their pants on. Uh, I mean, probably to do with modesty or not, uh, certainly in the French, Italian, even the British tradition, um, people would be nude, whereas the Russians, they kept their kit on.